start, we'd like to introduce our panel, uh, starting with Council Chair Dan Dugan, representing District 6. Well, good afternoon, Salt Lake City, and uh, thank you for joining us today to, on this Ask Me Anything on the budget. I uh, appreciate you all and your engagement. Uh, a couple, uh, and I'm Council Member Dan Dugan, District 6 on the east side. And just to kind of set the stage here, you know, you look at your uh, budget and that will set your priorities. So we want to make sure that we set our priorities first and then budget from there. And if you look at our, bu our priorities would be, first and foremost, the health and safety of our residents and the workforces coming into the city every day. Second is on the environmental side. We want clean air and we want clean water to drink. The third would be we need to take care of our city family so that they can take care of the residents and the workforces that are coming in. And finally, we need to look at uh, smart, equitable growth, affordable housing, and that wraparound service. So I take those priorities and then I look at the budget and how they uh, react to that or, and how they uh, work with those priorities. And I'll turn the time over now to Councilmember Mono. Thanks. Hi, uh, Council Chair. I'm Darren Mono. I represent District 5 on the City Council, which is uh, the middle of the city, south around by Liberty Park. Um, and just to add on to what Council Member Dugan said, the budget process is one of the most, sometimes most difficult to follow things that we do every year, but really probably the most important thing. And it really all comes down to the next few meetings. We've had a lot of presentations up till now from departments telling us what they're proposing and what the mayor has proposed in the budget this year. And now over the next few weeks is when we as council members deliberate all of that and make final determinations as to whether, what pieces of the mayor's budget we're just going to accept, what we're gonna make tweaks to, if there's anything that we're gonna reject or anything like that. And so it's really right now is the perfect time to be joining us and, and talking about the budget. And council member Fowler. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I am Amy Fowler, council member for District 7, which is the Sugar House area. Thank you for attending today in person and for people who are watching online. Um, as council member Mano said, we are in the midst of deliberating the budget. And I just want to point out a logistical thing that because it came up um, recently, we do have different types of sessions. We have a work session and a formal session. At our work session is where what council member Mano um, talked about is where we have briefings from the departments that give us information about their budget, what their priorities are. and. Um, kind of gives us that information we need to make decisions. We ask a lot of questions during that time and try to get as much feedback. During our formal session is really where it is just a formal session. We kind of solidify the formalities of, of other decisions that have been made within the work session. So if people are really wondering about a certain department or, or those budget discussions, I encourage people to log in or to come to our work session meetings. It is public, we, we have them on Facebook, we have them on SLC TV, and of course you can join us here live. Um, it does help kind of make sure you, you know that we're engaging in the process more than it looks like during just a formal meeting. I would also like to say that we welcome any questions today. This is an Ask Me Anything. Y, por favor, tengan en cuenta que también puede, puedo contestar sus preguntas en español. Si necesiten asistencia durante el evento, por favor, acérquense a Isaac or Whitney O si está en línea, escriban su pregunta en el chat. Gracias. Thank you, council members. Uh, as, as they said, this is an Ask Me Anything discussion. We're going to be taking your questions. So for those of you here in the room, uh, if you'll leave your name and question on a card with council staff, we'll be able to call on you to, to ask those questions uh, in person. If you're with us via WebEx, leave your question in the chat. Let us know if you'd like to be unmuted to ask it when that becomes appropriate. Um, if you're joining us online via Facebook or YouTube, use the comment section to ask your question, uh, and council, a council staff member will get that to me, uh, and I believe they are monitoring social media as well. Um, at the beginning of every year, the mayor works with each of the city departments to create a vision for a balanced city budget. Each May, the mayor collects all of that input and presents their recommended budget to the council, including all of their priorities and goals. It's at this point the council steps into the budget process, playing a critical role in reviewing, modifying, and approving the annual budget. The council hears from each department about these proposed budgets and goals by the end of May, and then 
as we start June, they enter the deliberation phase, and that's where we are now, after which a budget is approved and adopted. So what questions do you have about the council's role in that process? What questions do you have about the proposed budget? Uh, we would like to answer those. One quick note, while we'll do our best to answer everyone's questions, there might be some that we don't get to. Uh, these will all be compiled into a document with more in-depth answers after the event. You'll also be able to watch the event afterward on the city's YouTube page. And as a gentle reminder for those asking questions today, remember that we might have many questions to get through, so my hope is that you'll be able to be brief and remember that questions end with question marks. So without further ado, we'll get started. As all of you watching live uh, prepare your questions, council staff have received some advanced questions via social media. And the biggest thing that we heard about from a number of residents were about the property tax and utility rate increases in the proposed budget. Residents we heard from want to know why that might be necessary, and I'm wondering if one of you would like to, to kick off our discussion uh, tackling that right off the bat. Sure, thank you uh, for the question. So we have the two sides, the property tax side, you know, it, it is a, one of our largest uh, revenue sources. Property taxes and sales taxes are two largest revenue sources. And sales tax has gone up and has done well, but it is also can be volatile. In times, in, uh, times right now, it, it's doing very well. It could also have a downturn, and it's not as stable. Property tax is a much more stable uh, prop, uh, revenue source. And also, right now, the city is demanding, and the workforce and residents are demanding, a lot of uh, increased services. Uh, they're, they're asking for more safety. We're looking for uh, affordable housing, dis dispersed and uh, uh, s uh, support for all our services. We're, looking we're extending our uses of uh, public lands and trails, and all those come with a price. And then you tack on the idea that we have some inflation, and we have to pay our uh, city employees a good wage so that they stay on board so that they can also support those services. So that's why we end up with this this property tax. I, I will turn the time over if anyone else wants to. I can jump in on the uh, utility rate increases. So the city's proposing three utility rate increases this year and they're all 15% if I'm, if I'm correct. That's for sewer, water, and storm drain. Uh, the city has four utilities. The fourth utility is the street lighting utility and that does not have a proposed increase this year. 15% is high uh, and I acknowledge that this is something that the Public Utilities Department has been planning for many years. Actually during 2020 we had a planned increase and we did not do that because of some of the questions about the economy. Um, but Salt Lake City as I've heard the mayor say in several times recently, Salt Lake City is older than the state of Utah. And with that, we have 100 year, over 100 year old pipes pushing water through our city and collecting sewage. And just a, a couple weeks ago, we had a basically a pipe break and open up a sinkhole on the west side and a, swallowed up a car, like an entire car went into the road because of it. So we have um, severe infrastructure needs that we have to improve um, and, and catch up on. And that is one of the, main reasons why we're, tr we're um, seeking this, pro this um, utility fee increase in order to try and catch up on some of those. Just real quick, um, first I want to acknowledge that you can't see our trustee budget analysis and deputy executive director, but Jen Bruno is at the panel with us. And so if you see us at looking over and asking some questions or verifying some answers, it's because she is the know-all of our budget and um, make sure that we're not misquoting or misguiding um, anything. So uh, you may see us kind of look over in that direction and we're grateful for her being here for, with us. Um, and I say that because with the, pro the uh, utility rate increases, this has actually been a planned increase I believe since I've been on the council, it was presented to us in 2018's budget, if I'm not mistaken, with uh, knowing that we had the water reclamation project coming on, knowing that we had the sewage facility coming on board and needing a way to make sure that though that infrastructure that, that Council Member Mano was talking about, we were able to afford that, right? So there has been, and you can see, um, 
throughout that there's, I think, almost a 10-year plan or uh, something along those lines with those rate increases, and you can look at what we did increase and what we're going to increase in the future. I, I want to thank Director Laura Briefer from Public Utilities for providing that as it does provide some transparency to our constituents as we're able to see and plan uh, years in advance. With the property tax increase, you know, this is a proposal from the mayor. We haven't voted on anything yet. Um, and I think that we are looking, and I certainly am looking at what we can do, if there's anything, um, with the COVID and ARPA money and CARES money, we did uh, end up kind of needing to to spend money in a different way so that we could balance our budget and so that we could provide needs to the city that the city, um, our residents require, and we want to make sure we are providing. Um, I think with that, we're still we're still in negotiations and still looking and talking about it all. It's and as Councilmember Fowler mentioned, we have our know all uh, budget analyst here. And uh, I was corrected. There's actually a fourth. I have more bad news. There's a fourth increase. It's not technically within public utilities, but it's a refuse fee. So your sewer and trash collection, garbage collection, it's not sewer, gar garbage and recycling collection is also proposed at 15% increase. So uh, while we're on the subject of increases, another theme that came through a lot of the social media reaction in the in advance of this Ask Me Anything were questions about increases in the police budget. Why would we, why would we be doing that? What uh, is that for? Uh, if you could, if, who would want to speak to that? Sure, thank you. And this goes back to one of our first priorities of public safety. And you remember. Uh, a year and a half ago, the early days of uh, the pandemic, we had a number of unrest and we had a lot of uh, difficulties with the police. And we took a little pause there and we brought in the Racial Equity and Policing uh, Commission. And they also helped us out there on looking at our policing and looking at our uh, public safety side of the house. And we also realized that we needed to disperse some of that. And we also needed, realized that we also needed to pay our police officers uh, a, a fair wage for the, the for the uh, uh, the job that they're doing for us, and we did that, and we need to continue that portion of it. But we also have have a diversified model now. We're looking at additional social workers coming on board. We're looking at a, and these are all things that we're looking at right now. Additional social workers coming on board, uh, mental health team. Um, we're looking at the uh, civilian response team. All methods to allow us to diversify our response and take some of the high, uh, the low priority calls from the police down to a, a different source so we can improve our uh, calls for services and our times there, and then also reduce our crime. That takes time, that takes time and, and energy to continue, but we have to make sure that we're uh, paying for the services that our city demands, and one of those city's demands is, uh, was public safety. And so that would be one of the reasons why we uh, have that expense or request. Did anyone else want to jump in on that? Um, we have a follow-up. Uh, on the line, we have Janet Hemming, and uh, Janet has a question about the police department, and so I believe the, the magic behind the council staff is going to be unmuting them so that they can ask their question uh, as it's related to this topic. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, thanks to all three of you for hosting this opportunity. I think it's great that we get to interact with our elected officials. I appreciate it very much and appreciate all three of you. Um, I have a statement and then a couple of questions has to do with the police department budget and I'm very much pro police. So um, some of this I think is very good that we're doing, but concerned about a few things. I don't consider car break-ins, damaged property, suspicious persons, and unwanted people on property to be, quote, low-level crimes. If the word on the street is the police aren't going to respond to those, then the criminals just continue to commit them, which can escalate to other more serious crimes. I think it's a mistake to pass these offenses off to civilians 
Uh, just look recently at what happened in Ballpark at the senior citizen apartments where there was a recent murder. And for the past two or three years, residents have complained about unwanted or homeless people on the property so in did, attics and basements you, with car break-ins and assaults. Did you have a question? Yeah, I just thought I had a statement and then a question if I can just, I'm gonna finish up, is that all right? Well, uh, no, I mean, we're, we're here, this um, is an asking so anything session changed. for questions, so I'm hoping if you can get to your questions so we can get the council members uh, in respect for their time and everyone else watching. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, this has to do with, you know, the, 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 uh, whether it's going to be really effective to have civilians you know, answering these calls. I think I'm concerned about that. Let me just quickly jump to two more things. Um, the Promising Youth Program sounds very admirable, but I'm wondering if it will get to the root of crime since the intent of the new program is to get kids to see police as a group of people who help our city. If those interacting with the kids are civilians, I wonder if this effort belongs in another department. So that's one question and a quick follow-up. Can someone provide a profile of who's committing crimes in Salt Lake? Is it newcomers, gangs, out-of-state cartels, drug addicts? Because it would seem our major effort should be pointed in that direction. Thank you. So it sounds like there was, there was a few questions in there. The first would be, would civilians be effective in dealing with the crimes that, that the increases are proposing on that? And then uh, about the youth programs, and then about the profiles of who's committing crimes. So, who would like to, to jump in on that? If I may, um, I will take a stab at all three of these kind of quickly. So, um, first off, we just as a little bit of background in 2020, the council uh, made a decision and funded a very in depth audit of our police department. Um, that was in response to a lot of the constituents' concerns. It was in response to some of the things that had happened here in Salt Lake City, and in response to really wanting to make change within our police department in a very good and effective way. That audit found, and this is to the civilian um, calls, that audit found that in reality, a majority of our the calls that our police department was receiving didn't necessarily need a um, uniformed police officer to be present. And as a response to that finding, the council decided that we needed to look at alternative response models. Um, the civilian response model is something that other cities have done throughout the country that we're gonna be, I know the police department is interested in, the administration is interested in, and really making sure that we're doing it with the best practices in mind so that it is actually effective, both from a, um, both from a stance from, from the civilian or the, the resident who has experienced a car break-in or some sort of crime, um, but also from a, a redundancy, right, so that uh, we're not having a recidivism, excuse me, perspective, so that people are getting, hopefully, help that they needed or, or the whatever that response can be. And so we do, I do believe that this is an effective manner. I think that we can be a model for other cities around the, the country um, with our unique uh, response and alternative response models that we've created over the last two years. Um, and, and with that, we'll be looking at exactly what models are working. We've asked all of the departments to look at reporting how these different response models are going so that we can use qualitative data to make future decisions about funding for the best programs and best response models that we have. The, the promise in youth, yes, we are also, and I think that question came up a lot at our last budget meeting, is that we do have a different youth programs in different departments, and we've kind of asked all of those departments, hey, what, what's really going on, and how are we being effective for our youth? So I appreciate that question. I think that we are really trying to address it. Um, I forgot the third question, but, oh, uh, we do have a, what's it called, comps stat, um, and so we do, the police department does actually have statistics on all of the different metrics of people who are committing uh, offenses and where in the city they are doing that. And so they do actually concentrate resources in those different areas. Thanks, Councilman. I'll add just real quick, just to clarify, the civilian response 
model, as far as I understand it, and I hope this is true, is that if you're experiencing a break-in in progress and there's a person on your property, we are not sending a civilian. A, a police officer will come to that. It's if there's a break-in, you come home and you notice some things were stolen or a window was broken, there's nobody there currently that poses a, a safety threat to you, that's when a civilian responder will come, take down the details, and let our detective team or whoever it is follow up on some of the investigation. But if there is somebody on your property currently breaking in, we are not going to be sending a civilian to uh, protect you. It'll be an armed police officer. So uh, just to clarify that one point. Thank you, Councilmember Fowler and uh, Mono. Excellent points there. And I want to just kind of reiterate, the diversified model allows to take some of the stress off the police and allow them to focus on the uh, higher priority crimes that are going on in the city. And part of that model is also the, the mental response team where we have firefighters and a social worker going out there handling a, an emergency that they can handle that's not a, a nonviolent daytime type of a, an emergency that a police officer used to go be called into. Now he can deal with something else because it's really not in his uh, uh, basket of tool, a tool box, uh, basket or golf clubs. Hey, he's, he's doing something else. He's doing something more important and this is perfect for the fire department and for a social worker. The civilian response team, the same thing. These are for the, the lower priorities to take, the, take that stress off of, the, of a police officer so we can look at more of the uh, higher crimes and the higher priority side the house, the actual break-ins or the actual the crimes and scenes. So thank you. So we have a few follow-ups, uh, questions about the police budget that have come in through, the, through here, and, and I'm hoping we can kind of touch on these quickly. Uh, Jen Colby wrote in to, to ask about alternative funding for things that address, that would take the pressure off the police without necessarily giving that specifically to the police department. Uh, so, so they write, um, uh, what alternative program funding or staffing instead of policing is the council considering to address societal and infrastructure problems directly? For example, sustainable safety, safety through environmental design, housing first, things like that. Um, so there's a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. that, that's a, one of the main goals that we've had. Uh, so all, in. In all, I, I'm gonna miss some things, but we have the chat team within the fire department, which is um, a social worker combined with two firefighters. The medical response team in the fire department is two firefighters instead of four, responding on a small vehicle. Um, the community, see community commitment centers, am I saying that right? In the police department is the social worker co-responders. So there's so, trained social workers that respond with the police officer. Um, we've been funding through the Downtown Alliance, the Downtown Ambassadors, and that has expanded to the North Temple area and the Ballpark area. Uh, the HEART team is the city's um, homeless engagement and response team, and they help make sure that the community stays clean and connects individuals experiencing homelessness with shelter. Uh, the park rangers are getting up and going, and those are to be individuals, not police officers, but in our public parks, our larger public parks, as well as the Jordan River Trail. And then um, we've also been working with other partners uh, like um, MCOT and some of our uh, community partners at the university and VOA and all of those other um, organ organizations. So that's sort of the laundry list of things. And these are outside the police? Out, except um, the, right. all except for the community, the, uh, CCC is is within the police department, but the rest of them are outside of the police. Right. And if I can add, I think to part of your question, uh, Jen, is design standards that we're doing within the city. Um, and I, I think that that has been a priority for Salt Lake City for a very long time. But really, uh, what I can say is getting that activation going. So something that we've seen in the past and we can see right on State Street is that we have these crazy setbacks and, and you know, maybe some walled up parts of a building, whereas really what we're trying to do, and I know that people may be annoyed with all of the construction going on in Salt Lake City, but part of the theory and the goal with uh, um, this construction is that we're having that bottom floor with windows and with storefronts and closer to the sidewalk so that there is activation there. So I think um, I, I heard some of that design question. I hope I'm not misreading what, no, what right. you stated. But um, 
you know, I think that we really are trying to make sure that we have more walkable streets. Uh, I think you can see this over on 9th Central and everything that we did with the project in, in 9th Central so that we're really kind of changing the atmosphere of the streets themselves. And, and I know that through the RDA and through the council, that is a priority for us. So um, we've got two, uh, we've got Chris Butler on the line on the WebEx and we're going to bring them into the conversation. They've got two really quick follow-ups on the police uh, budget question, and then we're going to move on from the police after that. So, uh, Chris, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me okay? Indeed. All right. So, I just wanted to know, I think you've kind of touched on it, but did the council, like, talk to any people who are more in favor of defunding or abolishing the police when it comes to the budget because you know it's one thing to consult pro police but is you know the other side as well and then uh i watched the work session from the other day and you guys kind of touched on this also but just there's it seemed like there are lots of like they're getting one-time grants for programs that seem you know somewhat good to find um, but then they're one-time grants, so then their budget's always getting raised because these grants aren't funded after one time. Um, and so is that, I mean, I don't, I'm not familiar with the budget in the past, but is that the trend that they get lots of these one-time grants and then, you know, then we're on the hook to keep paying for them? Um, so yeah, those are my questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, quite a few, and we'll keep me straight on all the questions. The, the first one talking about the, uh, who do we communicate with? We've communicated with uh, across, this, across the city and we uh, brought along the Racial Equity and Policing Commission so that we could get a good view and make sure that we had our blinders off when we were talking about police reform and public safety. So we were sc uh, scanning the whole city on what is the best uh, method and part of the best message, as we just kind of described, was this diversified response. And those diversified responses are not just in the police department, but they're both uh, across the board there. So w we are looking across the board there on uh, the public safety side. As far as the, um, what was the next question? The oh, the grants. The yeah. Grant. There are some one-time grants that we, we have ongoing grants, but we also, if you look at the ARPA funding, the ARPA funding was a one-time funding, and that was part of the reason for uh, the, the property tax rate uh, increase was because ARPA gave us one-time uh, funding, but now for ongoing needs. And so now we have to fund it for the ongoing time. So we got a big chunk of money for one-time funding, but now we have to find ongoing revenue for doing that. And sales tax alone can't do that. We have to, we have to find other means also to, to provide the funding for those on, uh, ongoing fundings. But the question and that was asked is correct. There are a lot of programs that are funded and get started by grants and then have to transition to permanent funding. Um, and that happens in uh, most departments in the city, not just the police department. It does, and I appreciate you tuning into our work session last week because um, as you probably remember, it is a question that I asked and want to make sure that as we're looking at the one-time grants that our budgets are also looking at whether we should be awarding those grants, we should be having those grants, or w what and what that looks like for future budgets. So it, yes, it, yep. <laughs> so we have a question, we're gonna switch gears. Uh, we have a question from here inside the room. Uh, Steven, if you'd like to stand up, uh, they've got a question about garden park maintenance funds. Uh, we've got a microphone there for you. Um, we're here representing the Peace Gardens International Academy. Can you speak a we, little bit closer to the... Yeah. We have several concerns and hopes for the preservation of in International Peace Gardens in District 2. 60 years of theft and vandalism, hurricane damage, etc. has left the gardens a shadow of what what it once was. We're seeking guidance on how to have our request entered into the budget before it's adopted. Is it good to know that property taxes are being increased for the improvement of parks in response to more uh, public users? Are 
Are any new parks or expansions to all parks planned? From these specially allotted budget funds for park maintenance, which of the six following issues at the Peace Gardens could be addressed? And if not, from which parts of the budget, like capital improvement funds, can they, can they be? How can we make sure our proposed improvements are entered into the budget adoption? So I have um, six gold standards secured in patrols. That would include some sort of uh, cameras or chips in the sculptures. We just lost an $18,000 city asset to theft, and no one even made a police report. Treatment of six heritage trees so they don't have to be filled. Repair, repair of damaged sculpture and garden architecture, as well as refabrication of stolen bronze plaques and artwork. D, better restroom maintenance. E, ADA, ADA, ADA upgrades. And F, replacement of historic plants and trees. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, first off, can I also ask if you'll leave those points with us because they were great points and I know that Councilmember Pui, who um, is at District 2 would like to have that so we can look at taking some of those points to our Parks Division and seeing what we can do to implement those. Um, the other thing is ongoing maintenance. In this proposed budget, um, the mayor has proposed a sort of fifth bucket for the funding our future dollars. And if you remember a couple of years ago, we um, increased our sales tax to increase revenue, but we, we, we sort of took an oath, if you will, to make sure that those funds went to four different buckets, homelessness, streets improvement, um, homeless service, housing, housing affordability, excuse me, streets improvements, um, transportation and public safety, that's right. Um, and so the mayor is proposing a fifth budget, a, sort of a fifth bucket, if you will, which would be parks maintenance. And so that would, one of the things that we have a problem with with the budget is that ongoing maintenance cost and really having, we we talk about deferred maintenance all over the country and we're, we definitely have deferred maintenance here in Salt Lake City. So this would be one of that sort of ongoing revenue that would be dedicated to parks maintenance. In that, what the mayor proposed was a two million dollars to the public, uh, the park maintenance side of the house. We also part of the uh, budget for public lands and the parks was uh, additional funding to uh, uh, employ more seasonal workers. Right now, we're 36 seasonal workers down from the previous years because we can't get them hired, and so we need to, to pay them to bring them on board. And those seasonal workers do a lot of the daily maintenance, the cutting the grass, making sure the uh, sprinklers work, all the stuff that you kind of just mentioned that w that have probably been lacking recently. We need to fund those uh, seasonal workers so that we can uh, bring those on board and so we can get that work done. And we're looking at, do is it, uh, and the council's looking at this, hey, is it better to hire full-time FTEs to do that or every year to have a seasonal worker come in, have to retrain them, and th then they leave a few months later. And we're looking at the balance of that in the future also. But but uh, th the International Peace Garden is a gem for the city, and we do need to take care of it. And I think we're looking at all our, our parks across the board. So thank you. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'll say I appreciate the, appreciate the question and uh, the mayor's proposal for the fifth bucket for funding our future, um, as well as a proposal for a uh, both a sales tax bond and a general obligation bond. M the general obligation bond is proposed at an $80 million. That's something that, that if we as the council support it, it will be on the ballot so you as the voters can vote on that. Um, we're still discussing, the mayor has a proposal and we as a council are still discussing which specific projects to get into that uh, general obligation bond. And then the sales tax bond also includes a lot of parks projects. So there's a big investment in, pub in parks and open space this year. Uh, including some of those maintenance and staffing to help uh, tackle some of the, the concerns that you brought up. But there's also that every year we have a CIP application pro process and that started, so the, this year the projects that we're, we're 
deciding on were applied for by the community last October. So keep an eye out for October for the next year's application and for sure put, a, put an application in um, for the specific parks or specific capital improvements that you and anyone else listening is interested in in the city. But the, the ones that we're, we're considering right now are ones that were applied for last year. So if that makes sense with the timing. Could we? I'm sorry. Could we get you to, if, yeah. it, uh, with a follow up, which is which is fine. Just you know. Is there anywhere mic? we can turn um, on an emergency basis because uh, some of the artwork recently was removed for safekeeping, and some of the uh, culture groups are anxious to have it returned, not maybe two years from now. We can we, um, we can collect your information and we'll pass that along to the administration because there is there there is emergency maintenance funding. Um, sometimes it just means that we need to send through a request to the administration. So if we could c get your information after this, that would be great. Thanks. Thanks. So uh, while we're on the subject of parks, uh, another question that we've got uh, via WebEx from N Canada, um, and it's something we see a lot on the social media channels for the city as well. Um, Curiosity about why we're spending money on golf courses. Uh, N Canada here asks, is that money not better spent elsewhere and turning the unprofitable courses to nature preserves? Um, if, if you want to just talk about golf courses and the funding of them and how they're fitting in the budget, uh, that, would be, that would be great. Thank you. As the resident golfer, I think that I have to take this question. And I certainly understand the conversation about golf courses and whether or not um, the, the funding is worth it. Um, and I, I would say yes, and not just because I'm a golfer, but because there are public benefits that we get out of our golf courses. And while they may not make enough money to sustain themselves, it's similar to sustaining a park. None of our parks are, uh, we don't charge for our parks, yet we still have to pay for them. And so I recognize that it, golf is sort of this other activity, but similar to going to um, a swimming pool, a public swimming pool in the summertime, and you have to pay a nominal fee to get into the swimming pool for its maintenance. I don't know that there's a profit turned on those public swimming pools, but it creates a benefit for people, and I think that golf does the same thing. Um, something we talked about at the last work session was, I live on 900 East. There's a golf course that is right there on 900 East by my house. I walk or drive past it almost every day and it creates an, an ability for me to see the mountains and for everyone driving by to see the mountains and see that open space um, and I think that that is incredibly important um, whereas if we didn't have it there and it was just a, a nature preserve or a park we may not be able to maintain it as we're talking about parks maintenance and or it could become something as we see in Sugar House as another apartment building. So um, it, there are really public benefits to it during the pandemic. It was the only thing that was open because um, you could recreate there and we didn't really charge that much for people to go out and and play some golf and be able to recreate with one another and families or friends that they haven't seen in a time of isolation. And um, I, there was something else I was going to say and now I forgot, but you know, I, I think that we're changing our minds on what it is. Oh, I was gonna say in the winter time when there actually is snow in Utah, um, we uh, uh, open our courses. Our courses are always open for people to cross country ski on, to create other recreation and activities that we, we don't charge for. So in essence, it is sort of its own park that is maintained in a, in a way. So I appreciate the question and I get it often, but I do believe um, in how we're looking and changing what golf looks like and what recreation looks like. Um, and it's just another tool for us to have and to offer our residents. We've got another question from the WebEx. We're gonna switch gears a little bit. Uh, so hopefully Jen, Jen Colby has a question about climate action. Um, but while we're waiting for, for Jen to get unmuted, I would like to remind everyone watching uh, online that you can leave your comment and the, the council staff will get it to me so that we can put it to the, the, the council members here. 
And for those of you in the room, if you'd like to make any other uh, questions, just, just have another card ready to go and council staff will give it to me. So, uh, Jen, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, I wanted to say thanks for hosting this AMA today. It's really helpful um, to have this uh, chance to watch and speak to you directly. A quick note on the golf course. We lost you. That was a very quick note on golf courses. Um, so while you get your, your audio together, um, are you there? While we wait to see if Jen can come back, Jen, if you can let council staff know if you can get, can get your, your microphone working again, just I would ask a general question about um, climate issues and how they affect the budget and how you look at the numbers and, and work on the, the budget from that perspective. <laughs> so great question. And if you look at our priorities, you know, it, clean air and clean water. And we, we touched on the, the clean water section with uh, Councilmember Mono discussing the uh, infrastructure on the, the water treatment plants and the, the water system and then the sewage plants, uh, the sewage system. On the air side of the house, one of the big things we're looking at is public transportation. Uh, and with public transportation, you need some density to go along with that so public transportation can be uh, viable. And we've have, we have funding for, I think, close to a million dollars of hive passes which will allow uh, residents to travel uh, free on uh, public transportation. And one of the programs is for the K through 12 uh, group uh, so that they can use public transportation all year round. Uh, FTNs, the uh, frequent, transit through frequent transit networks, right? Which we want to increase our head time so that we can have more turns and so more people have more reliable public transportation across the city and allow people and services to, to, to travel across the city so we don't need to be in our car. And, and along with that, we're looking at some, there's some ideas that uh, we're floating around. It's not in the budget right now of uh, increasing the uh, zero fare February that we did last year. You know, that was a big plus for the city and for the UTA and for the five counties. And we're looking to see if we can work with the uh, legislators on, on funding that and moving that forward and maybe doing that for the winter time. But really right now, it's one of the big issues is public transportation and having a livable, walkable city so people can get out of their car uh, uh, and ride their bicycles, ride their scooters, take a walk in a safe manner. That this, this, this goes into uh, street calming effects. This goes into uh, separated bike lanes. All these are we're being looked at for funding, and these also require the engineers. So that's why when you see our budget, you see that we have additional engineers there so that we can get these programs on the way and, and moving forward. And Councilman Dugan, I'll just add on to that. We have air quality and environment actually I think is one of the pillars that we look at in almost every decision we make, even with things like the RDA and funding affordable housing. We have made policies that affordable housing projects that are funded to a certain level by city dollars can have zero on-site combustion, meaning no gas, all electric, so that the air quality in our city doesn't get worse because of the buildings that we're building. Um, we've also been, um, there's something new that I'm really excited about that was just sort of tested this year, but in the next few years budgets, I think we'll see a little, use a little bit more, which is called program-based budgeting. And the two departments, the police department and the finance department tested it out this year. And everything that they wanted to change in their budget, everything in their budget, they. Um, did a decision matrix and decided whether or not that that was a good decision. And one of the columns on that was air quality, whether it advances air quality goals and environmental goals. And that's something that I think we can, we can look at almost everything we do in the city and decide whether or not it meets some of those goals. And, and as you, as we sort of refine and, and, and finesse the way that we decide on our budget over the next few years, I think you'll see that a little more explicitly. I hope you will at least. I just want to also touch on, you know, this last year we had a groundbreaking ceremony out there in Tooele for an 80 megawatt uh, solar farm. And Park City and Salt Lake City uh, went in, uh, combined together to contract for that uh, solar power farm. And that, that is to, uh, for the city to uh, reach its 100% uh, net renewable by 2030 
for the city, the city corporation. We also have the Community Renewable Energy Agency, which is also looking at doing the citywide for the residents and businesses 100 uh, percent net renewable by 2030 also with 18 other cities. So we are focused on that across the board uh, in Salt Lake City and the Council. I was just going to point out also that we have the first two of three fire stations that are um, lead, like the highest lead thing you can have, <laughs> whatever that is, Darren would know, um, and um, zero uh, carbon footprint when they were being built and now. So we, it is certainly a commitment here in Salt Lake City. So Jen uh, t typed their question in and I have it now. So um, they, w they, they say that climate change is accelerating far faster than worst case scenarios with some effects that were anticipated for the 2080s happening now. Do you believe that the mayor's city budget matches, cli matches um, the climate change emergency mitigation needs? And what changes are you considering to the budget, if any, for both reducing direct city carbon emissions and, for the, and those of city residents and businesses? I hope that our previous answers sort of answered that question. Um, I think we kind of touched on what we're doing in the city directly and how I think Council Member Mano really touched on um, the different departments and looking at their proposed budgets when they give it to the mayor, making that priority based or program based budgeting decisions and having that climate change uh, or climate consciousness uh, as one of those columns that they sort of look at. Um, so I, th I hope, Jen, that we answered your question and you were able to hear that in our prior discussion. As to whether our city is going to end climate change, I, I wish I could say yes, but <laughs> we need everyone in the, every city and every government in the world to help us with that. But we are in Salt Lake City trying to do as much as we can, everything that we can. And I just, we talk about the water drought and the uh, water conservation me uh, measures we're taking across the city. And I ap applaud uh, the residents for conserving water because it's so vital and important. And one of the big aspects of that conserving water is making sure that the uh, Great Salt Lake uh, levels don't drop any further and they actually get better because without that Great Salt Lake, our air quality, no matter what we do, will be uh, severely impacted. So we've got some questions that came in. Um, one question that came in from social media is how much is being budgeted to spend on inland port litigation? So um, the way that the city uh, engages in litigation is actually with the attorney's office and so um, it's not the same as in the private sector where an attorney bills for a specific work. It's the city has attorneys on staff regardless of whether or not the city is in litigation. So I think it would be accurate to say that some of the attorney's office budget is being spent on that litigation. However, um, that money would be spent regardless of if that particular litigation was ongoing, that, um, that they're there to um, represent the city in any lawsuit. And it's a, um, essentially a sunk cost. So. Can I make, put some of that in layman's terms yeah. too, Jen? <laughs> we hire city attorneys, so the budget goes to their salary, and their salary and their position goes to whatever the city needs legally, and the Inland Port is part of that. Okay. <laughs> we got a question that came in from Instagram um, wondering about any budget considerations that are going to increase safety in Salt Lake City School District schools. I think, I think definitely looking at current events, is there anything the city's doing in the budget process on that front? That, I mean, we don't... We don't have a lot that that is a, a school district budget issue. Um, I think it's important to note that the school, our Salt Lake City schools have their own district with their own elected officials um, that will be on the ballot in November as well. I think there's some board positions up um, with that with their own budget, with their own executive directors uh, that is different from Salt Lake City and what we can do. So we don't. Um, as a city have a lot um, 
of say as far as what happens within those school districts um, or within our schools? And Jen, I w um, yeah, can, we, we do have SROs within our schools um, and school resource officers. Yes, thank you, school resource officers. That um, and and we've actually I think the last year we increased their we might have increased their budget last year um, so that we could have school resource officers in almost all of our schools, if not all of them. Yeah, within our Racial Equity and Policing Commission, they had broken into subcommittees, and one of them was focused on school safety. So this, or the school age children, the, so one of, the, one of their main focuses was that. The other way that we fund public safety for school children, which is a little tangential, but is the crossing guards. That's something that comes out of the city budget. Um, but as Councilmember Fowler said, most of what happens in the school building itself is through the school district and their property taxes. Um, so there's a few ways that we overlap and we try and support what the school district is doing, um, but they are a, sometimes a bit tangential with the exception of the school resource officers, which are actual police officers in the schools. So in the budget, there are two proposed bonds. Um, could, you, could you talk about what those two proposed bonds would be for? So, Neither of them are actually in the budget officially, right? Well, the there's sales tax. There's a placeholder. Place sales tax okay. So but the, that they're, maybe you could say they're part of the package that the mayor presented. Yeah. yeah, so there's two bonds that are being considered this year, and I mentioned them earlier. One is the sales tax bond. That is a bond basically the city's taking out a loan to do some big projects, and we're going to pay that back out of our sales tax, our future sales tax receipts. The other is called the general ob obligation bond, and that would be an additional assessment on every property owner's property in the city. And that, and because that increases the property tax um, for those specific projects, that's something that needs to be voted on in the November ballot, assuming that we support it and put it on the ballot. And Jennifer, just correct me here, on the sales tax bonds, we're retiring debt from a previous tax bond, and this bond would, uh, the payment for this bond would be replaced, would replace the debt service that we were paying for for the previous bond. And the projects that are proposed within the sales tax um, bond and the GEO general obligation bond generally mostly have to do with parks and open spaces, um, really for both of them, and then some infrastructure on public assets. Um, and pu by public assets, I, we're talking Fisher Mansion, um, Warm Springs, uh, the, the Warm Springs, what is that called? Building, I guess. Plunge. <laughs> yeah, Plunge. plunge. Um, and some other public assets that have had a lot of deferred maintenance that we haven't gotten to um, that would allow us to make sure that we maintain and keep those uh, public assets up to a standard where hopefully people can can, can utilize them in the future. So. The majority is parks and public assets. And the biggest individual project that the mayor's proposed is the Glendale Regional Park. Which, which is, used to be the Raging Waters. Used to be the Raging Waters. There's $27 million proposed in the GO bond currently. That's where it's currently sitting um, to make that. And so that's by far and large the biggest individual project of any of on this list of projects. And so with these two bonds, it's a list from the mayor of projects and costs, and it's the council's responsibility, and that's what we're doing right now, is to review those projects, review those, that funding, and uh, decide whether we want to keep it, tweak it, change it, uh, and that's what we're discussing here at this, at this moment. So we have another question from the WebEx. Um, as far as the budget is concerned, has the city analyzed the impact of various cities' fines and fees on lower income and unhoused people? And has the city considered a sliding scale or waived fees to keep these from becoming debt traps for people least able to pay? I can provide a little information and then hopefully you guys can translate it. The state law is um, uh, very, it ties the city's hands with regard to property taxes. The city has to levy a specific property tax as well as fines. 
Um, we are not allowed to differentiate what we charge in those taxes or fees based on um, people's income or, or employment status. However, there, the county does have some programs uh, that provide property tax relief, and there's even a rent relief program um, that's uh, managed by the state. Um, I believe it's rentrelief.gov. I'll, I'll confirm that um, web address, and we'll make sure to get that correct information out. Um, but our, our hope is that we will um, provide a lot of that information to the public via our website. Um, and so uh, the public can go to our website to, to check that out. The one thing that we do have in our budget is water assist, which is a um, assistance for low-income households to pay their utility bills, and there's a proposed increase in that amount. Of course, because we're increasing the um, the rates, we also want to increase the assistance for people that are having a hard time paying those rates. So we've got one last question we'll close out with, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, one thing we've heard a lot since the budget had been proposed was uh, about uh, increasing the budget to give a raise to city employees. I mean, as a city employee, I'm grateful, but uh, there are uh, definitely some questions about why we would be why would we we would be doing that? Thank you, and very good question. So, uh, to take on all the demands of the city and the workforce that come into the city every day, uh, we need to pay our employees a. Uh, 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 just salary. Right now, unemployment is at two. We're, we're on the lowest states for unemployment. And uh, inflation is also driving some costs here. And if we want to keep good workers and good employees providing the, the services that we want to see across our city, we need to uh, pay them accordingly. And I, I think these employees uh, are doing an incredible job right now. And we are, in some areas, very understaffed. And we can't have our, uh, we, some of these projects won't get off, off the ground without additional employees and without the, a pay raise for the, uh, the current employees. Can I also just add that uh, we are the capital city and we have a lot of demands within the city. And pre-pandemic, um, our, our population doubled in size every day as people were coming into work. Um, and then leaving again. And all of that requires employees here within the city to effectuate all of the things that, that we have and that our residents and workers need um, uh, here within the city. So it, it, while we're not doubling, I don't think at this point, we are reopening and getting back to that. And last year we took a really uh, hard look at our compensation philosophy with the mayor's office and recognizing that we are the capital city and that we should be paying top notch for our employees because we do demand so much out of them. And I think that just as in any business, at some point the city is a business, and just as in any business, you have to make sure that your employees feel um, valued and want to stay working for your business, and that is, very important to me. I always say we have the best staff in the country. I've been to a lot of cities in this country, and I think that we do, and I want to keep it that way, and I want to make sure that people really do uh, feel, feel that value from our perspective and that we are being able to give back to the residents in the needs that they have. Uh, thank, thank you. I just want to add, and I don't, at the risk of making this too political, um, we have I think one of the biggest crises in our country is that people aren't paid well enough to do the work that we are asking them to do in the service sector. And a lot of our jobs in the city are groundskeepers or maintenance people. Um, and we as a city, me as a council member, I want our city to be an example to every other organization that we need to pay our workers what they deserve so that they can live and afford to be part of our community. Um, pay inequality is a huge problem and we at the city don't want, we want to lead in that effort, not trail. So I want to thank you all uh, for, for doing this. Unfortunately, we're out of time. 
Uh, for those of you watching, if your question wasn't answered, please visit slccouncil.com for more information or contact the council by email at council.comments at slcgov.com or by phone at 801-535-7600. If you didn't get to catch the full Ask Me Anything session, stay tuned for the replay online on Facebook, YouTube, and slccouncil.com. The council will be holding a public hearing on the budget next Tuesday, June 7th at 7 p.m., right here in this room. We would invite you to make comments in person, online through WebEx, or by telephone. Uh, I'd like to thank council members Dugan, Mono, and Fowler, and the council staff for the time that they uh, took to put together this event, and, and uh, until next time. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Brian, appreciate it. Thank you.